Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Marshall Glen Baptist Church, and welcome to those who may be watching by our live stream broadcast as well. <clears throat> as we prepare for worship, let us be reminded of these words by Henry Nowlin, Dutch professor, writer, and theologian. For he said these words, Look up, you whose gaze is fixed on this earth, who are spellbound by the little events and changes on the face of the earth. Look up to these words, you have turned away from heaven disappointed. Look up, you whose eyes are heavy with tears and who are heavy and who are crying over the fact that the earth has gracelessly torn us away. Look up, you who burdened with guilt cannot lift your eyes. Look up, your redemption is drawing near. Something different from what you see daily will happen. Just be aware, be watchful, wait, just another short moment, wait, and something quite new will break over you, for God will come. With that being said, let us worship. Good morning. Please stand.
Romans 10, or excuse me, 12, verses 10 through 12. Paul writes for us, Be devoted to one another in love, in joyful, in hope, patient, affliction, be faithful in prayer. Would you let us pray? Father, in Paul's writing here in the book of Romans, we are given a vivid reminder of just how complex life can be and just how wounded we are. And our need, Lord, to dig deeper into the grace that is provided to us. For he describes that image that reminds us that loving others like Jesus does require more than good intentions and well wishes. It requires us being devoted to one another, joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. It requires being willing to not only rejoice with those who rejoice, but also it calls upon us to mourn with those who mourn. And therefore, it requires all of us, our entire being. For in a broken world which we live, none of us, escape unwounded hurt and scars that are deeply embedded in each of us. But, Father, deeper still is the love and the grace that we find in Christ Jesus. For His love is tender enough to draw out those thorns with the balm of compassion, causing us to be willing to embrace both wind friend, and enemy, and Lord, to find healing deep within our souls altogether, provided by Him. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Leroy's sister was home alone one day, and there happened to be a man knocking on her door. She opened the door, and the man said, I am from the Census Bureau. May I ask you some questions? Sure, she said. The man replied, How many people live here? Four, she replied. Myself. Mama is one, but she is in a hospital committed. Pa lives here, but he's in prison. And my brother Leroy is at Yale University. The man said, okay, let me see if I got this right. Your mom has been committed to an institution. Your father is in prison. And your brother is at Yale University. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Then the man asked, well, what is your brother studying at Yale? She replied, he ain't studying anything. They're studying him. So <laughs> If you're here this morning and you're visiting with us for the very first time, we ask that if you would, please, please, please tear off that tab, fill out that tab, put it in the offering plate. When the offering plate comes by your way in just a few moments, our members and regular tenders are going to stand to their feet. We're going to greet one another. And when you greet that first person, ask them, do you think Leroy ever got out of Yale? Let's greet one another. <laughs>
All right, all right. In the way of announcements, let me please remind you that all gifts that are to be returned to the children's home, if you, we have three gifts that are still absent, they're not been returned yet, but we need them by Wednesday night here at the church. They're going to be taking them this coming Saturday to the children's home. So if you're one of those three, please, please, please do your shopping, get those gifts back by Wednesday evening so that we can return and gift those to those young people there at Baptist Children's Home. Uh, also, there's going to be a garage sale uh, Saturday the 2nd from 8 to 1, and all this is going to be at Sammy's house. Sammy uh, is right there, so if you want to know how to get to Sammy's house, see her immediately following service. She will help direct you how to get there. From 8 to 1, all proceeds go to the Worship Center Extension. Uh, see her, talk to her. Uh, and it's also an opportunity for them to uh, evangelize and talk about Jesus at this special time of year. So if you want more information about that, see Sammy. You got your December calendar. Notice the events uh, uh, coming up this month uh, as well. Uh, they're there. I'm not going to go over the calendar. Put that somewhere where you can look at it. Uh, also, note that uh, in our uh, bulletin, December 10th at 6 p.m. is the cantata. There are invitations. Uh, let me get my hands on one here that you can give out uh, and you can also mail out to individuals that we'd like to see the sanctuary full. We'd like to be able to have to pull out chairs, but that's six o'clock December 10th. Don't forget that. Also this evening, uh, there'll be no services. However, those that are going to be singing and participating in the cantata uh, rehearsal is what time? 4.30. Okay. You're expected to be here at 4.30 for a cantata choir rehearsal. So don't forget that. Uh, and also notice in, in your bulletins, Wednesday evening, we're going back. Uh, Wednesday night, 6 o'clock for evening prayer service and Bible study as we look uh, at the signs of the times. Uh, and then next Wednesday night over at the Fellowship Hall, uh, we will be having our monthly <coughs> celebration of birthdays and anniversaries. Uh, and also, supposedly, I think of fish fry. Is that correct, ladies? Okay, I'm getting the nod. That, that is correct. So you'll want to be, uh, and I think there's a sign-up sheet out there at 6 o'clock. Yes, 6 o'clock next Wednesday over there. All right. If there's no uh, more announcements at this time let's continue in our worship of song please stand again <laughs>
kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today on this beautiful Sunday morning that you've given us, Lord. And we just thank you for everything that you do for us as a community, as a family, as a church family, Lord. You have blessed us so much this past year. Now we've come to a part of the service where we give back a small portion of what you blessed us with, Lord. And we just ask that you bless these, this, this tithe for the furtherance of your kingdom. And we ask it in your blessed, blessed name. Amen. 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 People walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, 
establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. From now through the end of December, uh, we will be lighting the Advent candle, preparing our hearts and our souls for the celebrated event of Advent, the birth of Christ. If you have your Bibles, thank you, Randy and Barbara, for that reading. Turn with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And would you please stand with me as we reverence the reading of God's word together. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world shall be registered. This census first took place while Quirinus was governor over Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth, forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Let us pray. Father, it is truly my desire to the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, who is my rock and my redeemer. You may be seated. For the next several weeks, <clears throat> the title of the Christmas series sermons will be More Than a Story. More Than a Story. There was a poll from the Pew Research Center reports that fewer Americans than ever believe the Christmas story is actually historical. The New York Times reports here about the Christmas wars that are happening all across our country. The most seismic change captured by the survey from a theological standpoint may be the declining number of people who said they believed the biblical story of Christmas accurately reflected historical events. The survey asked respondents about their belief in four parts of the biblical story. That an angel herald the birth of Jesus. That it was a virgin birth. That wise men were guided to the baby, Jesus by a star. And that he was placed in a manger. Only 57% of Americans believe in all four. Down from 65% in 2014. There were two factors that contributed to the trend, the researcher said. One was that atheists and the religiously unaffiliated appeared even less likely now than in the past to believe the story of Jesus' birth. The second was a small but significant decline of roughly 5% in the share of Christians who believe in the Christmas narrative contained in the Bible. For me, this is frustrating on several levels. First, it indicates how much Americans may have bundled the Christmas stories into the same magical basket with all their other enchanting tales that, that maybe seem to clutter up 
this wonderful celebrated holiday. I personally believe it has been one of Satan's cleverest tricks to pollute the Christmas celebration with all sorts of magical, mystical nonsense. Let's face it. If you have, and we're getting ready, if you've not already done so, we're going to have a steady diet of talking snowmen. A steady diet of flying reindeer. An elf who lives at the North Pole and travels around the world popping down chimney. Then an old fellow in England who sees ghosts, the sugar plum fairy, and the dancing nutcracker. Then you're all more likely to take the story of shepherds who see angels and mystical wizards from the Far East who follow a magical star. Put them into the same category of enchanting Christmas fairy tales. Now, hear me now, Pastor Darrell, not saying there's anything wrong with watching Rudolph and Santa Claus Story of Frosty the Snowman or, or any of those little programs or Charlie Brown Christmas. There's nothing wrong with watching those as long as we don't try to bring that narrative and compare it with the real reason for the season. The other disconcerting problem is a misunderstanding of the biblical narrative and story itself. I know everyone loves the idea of, of three wise kings going on a long track on camels following a supernatural star, but the Bible doesn't actually say that. Therefore, what the cynics are dismissing is not the Bible story, but the legends and the fanciful version that have grown up around and were created in the mix of these Bible stories. And there's the problem with the questions themselves. People were only asked about these four features of the biblical story. The angel to Mary. The wise men following a star, the virgin birth, and the manger bed. Respondents may well have said they don't believe in these supernatural elements, but still believe the essential history is correct, or they may well have disagreed with the question because they knew the Bible didn't actually teach, for example, that the wise men followed a magical star. This is why the most important theologians, scholars, and apologetic work going on at this time may not be arguments for the existence of God, but prove that the New Testament and the writings surrounding this most wonderful story is historically reliable and correct. What I want to do in this coming month is to endeavor with much study for the mystery of the magi the quest to identify the three wise men but there are also a whole shelf of other ways and means in which we can support the biblical account of the story craig bloomberg's the historical reliability of the gospel is a seminal text Bant Pitry's The Case for Christ, Robert Hutchison's Searching for Jesus, are just a few of them for your own reading as well. Colin Murphy's The Mystery of the Last Supper. They're just a few of a growing number of books which will help substantiate, support the Bible as it needs any support, but nevertheless, they're out there. Read them, know them, be accountable to encounter this insidious attempt to portray the gospel in no more than pious fiction, sincere fables, and fanciful moralistic tales. When you consider the literally billions of Christians have told and retold the story of Jesus' birth over the course of nearly 
two millennia, over 2,000 years. For me, it is the most wonderful, magnificent story ever told, but also that is reliable and true. So, it is remarkable how we keep wringing meaning, meaning from a story that in its purest form consists of less than 20 verses of Scripture. Few enough to fit on one printed page. Think about what we know about the first Christmas. We have four different gospel accounts in the New Testament. Each one of the gospel writers take a different approach. Mark, the youngest writer of the gospel in the gospel of Mark, he takes the action to hurry up. Babies don't mean so much to him. He skips right to the wild man, John the Baptist, the first cousin of Jesus, in the desert. In Mark's writings, there's no angels. Shepherds, wise men, star, manger, or even a virgin Mary. Now, some have suggested that's due to his, his youthfulness and his young age, but possibly so. But I just see Mark as an energetic, you know, young person. Just, let's hurry up and get to the real stuff. Let's get to the real purpose, to the real reason. Matthew who otherwise bases much of his account on Mark's gospel, does, however, add the story of Christ's nativity. He starts with one of Jesus' genealogies. And it goes in some translation, well, this one begat that one, this one begat that one, and you go through a whole series of begats. And you, What does that word mean? Well, look it up and for yourself. It means they fathered and mothered and they, they were born and so forth and so on. But this is a kind for many people who are studying this wonderful story and this celebrated event. When you look at Matthew's gospel, all that genealogy, I bet many of us have it made through about three or four sentences. That stuff's just boring to me. Why do I need to know? Well, it's important because from the very beginning... When God prophesied and, and Randy and Barbara read about in Isaiah there, one that was to be 700 and something years before the actual event took place. But when you look at the genealogy and follow the genealogy right up to his birth, a perfect Savior was born. It was prophesied and then he is born. But think about that. Some gems in those first 17 verses of the New Testament. We learn that Jesus descended from all kinds of individuals. All kinds of actions and attitudes and, and personalities. Like Abraham, for one. Anybody know anything much about Abraham? Well, he, he, was, he was the father of faith and so forth there in the Old Testament. But, you know, he had a tendency to, to uh, lie, you know, occasionally when it was convenient. And then there's Isaac. Then there's Jacob. Oh, my goodness. In South Georgia terms, Jacob would be referred to as a scoundrel, or in even deeper South Georgia term, a rascal, somebody you did not want to be associated with, or your children to be associated with. And then there's Solomon. Oh, well, now I know about Solomon, you say, because he's the wisest man that ever lived. No, not quite. He was for a time there. But much written by Solomon, all of life was vain. And you can't dismiss the fact that he had a whole lot of cucumber vines. I meant concubines. He had a lot of women. Okay? And then we are also 
the list of Tamar and Rahab. Rahab in the Old Testament, remember, had a lifestyle that would make most shudder in the New Testament church today. For a woman to walk into this congregation, into this fellowship, believing that she could be used by the Lord, believing that she would be open with love and acceptance. However, because of her lifestyle of being a prostitute, many would say, kick her out. She doesn't belong here. Not going to happen. But you won't get into their whole stories this morning. You know, I would not want my daughter or granddaughters or any of your daughters to follow in Rahab's professional footsteps in that lifestyle. But when you read the stories of Tamar and Rahab, then you understand that they will be ancestors of the Messiah and you realize some powerful truths about this most wonderful story. First, it should be of no surprise that our God is a God of surprises. I mean, who would have ever thought that 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago, B.C. in your life, and that stands before Christ, that you'd be sitting here on a Sunday morning hearing a sermon about the most wonderful, magnificent, marvelous story ever told and lived. If you'd have thought that about yourself 50 years ago before Christ, you'd have said, oh, that ain't going to happen. Not me. God doesn't seem to write the script the same way that we think it ought to be written. He doesn't seem to be troubled at all by the fact that this mortal life can awfully get messy at times. And that individuals that we might think that are insignificant, are very low on the social economical standard of life, are unworthy to be even accepted or thought that God could use them in any way. Well, Thank God that you're not God and I'm not God. He doesn't see it that way. And the history of this story going way back is unbelievable, remarkable. He doesn't seem to be troubled by the fact that this mortal life can get messy. Why not? Because here's the second. God God, and hear this, you get nothing else, get this. God can turn anything that is rotten and dirty and nasty into good and a pleasure for His namesake. No matter what you are, no matter what you and I have done or what has been done to you, God can take that crumpled up, messy life and make it into a life that is beautiful and brings glory and honor unto his name and fulfill his kingdom work here in the now and in the future. God can make it right. Now, we may not always see it right away. And it may not even happen when and where we can see it. But God, God is in the business of redeeming history, but also in redeeming humanity. Taking us from where we are on the junk pile, on a heat pile, being discarded with no significance, no value, no worth whatsoever. Taking that garbage dump and then placing you in the mighty maker's hand and creating with you a vessel of honor through his redemptive work. Man, that is a wonderful story. And it's all attached to this event that we're getting ready to celebrate. This is the lesson that we're able to get in the last half of the opening chapter of just the book of Matthew. 
which also introduces us to Mary and Joseph. Now, I, I love the way that throughout Matthew's gospel, he shows Jesus to be the fulfillment of all the Jewish law and prophets. But in the first chapter, he so focused on Joseph as the heir of David's throne that he centers the story of the birth of Jesus, not on mother and child, but rather on the dad, Joseph, who isn't even really the dad. Because of the divine conception that was brought on by the Holy Spirit, where the seed was put into Mary's womb by none other than God himself. You mean, Pastor Dare, you actually really believed in the virgin birth? Absolutely. Absolutely. For there is no way possible for a perfect sacrifice to go to the cross except it happened by Almighty God and by that event. No other way. No other person could have hung upon that cross because of the sin nature. He had no sin nature. He was tempted, but there was no sin nature born into him because he was born from above and then placed into Mary's womb on that immaculate conception. You say, well, that's not Baptist theology. Well, it ought to be. It's what I studied. It's what I was taught. But I believe in the divine Virgin birth of Mary. I love Joseph's com heart of compassion and mercy. I love his listening ear. I love his steadfastness. I love his desire to protect. And I love that the angel who visits Joseph gives the same message to him that the angel will later give to Mary, the mother of Christ, and then to the shepherd. And some of the same words, fear not. Why? Because as we've learned, God is going to pull it all together and make it all right. The most wonderful story. And it's more than just a story. It's not one that you clump in there and you put it you know, alongside of how the Grinch stole Christmas and compare it. Has, it's separated far above and beyond. But after so many years of us celebrating this glorious event and reading the story, reading it to your children, maybe when they're young, you've heard me tell about reading, I would read the Christmas story in Luke's Gospel every Christmas Eve to Christy and some of the other cousins but after Christy got about 15, she said, Dad, I think I'm a little bit old for this. <laughs> said, okay, hon, you can read it for yourself. But the story and this month, this uh, just, I, I'm telling you, it's just magnificent, miraculous, marvelous. But I'm afraid that over the course of time and, and history, and each and every year that passes, and each and every year that we get older, maybe, maybe somehow, some way, some reason, the story just loses its, it just doesn't really do anything for me. Really. Really. The most beautiful, wonderful story ever told and lived. And it still does nothing for you. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'm coming up on a birthday, and next year I'll be 70. And if I live to see 70, this is still the most wonderful, magnificent story that I've ever heard, read, or studied. Mainly because it's truth. And truth came to live and reside one day in my heart and in my life by what happened there in a manger years ago it's not a fictional story as some would have us to believe it's not a story that that you you're going to compare it with you know the, the little old book that 
we read when we were kids, Old Yeller. <laughs> it's not to be compared with, with Huckleberry Finn. You say, you are really dating yourself. I've never heard of the, well, they're good books. Read them. There's a beautiful storyline there. But it compares nothing to this story, to this story. Whereas we see God in his createdness of how the birth came about, but how redemption comes to mankind. If this event doesn't take place, it has been prophesied of one to come. If it doesn't happen and doesn't take place exactly like the scripture says that it does and will be rolled out and happen, we are doomed. We have no hope. We have no joy. We have no peace. We have no gift giving. If you take Christ out of the picture, what are, December would be, you know, would be just empty and void of all that comes with the celebration of this most wonderful story. Could you imagine? Where would we be this morning if there was no birth of Christ? Well, where would we be, Pastor? We wouldn't be here. What do you mean we wouldn't be here? The church wouldn't exist. It only exists because of Christ. We're only able to do the things that we do because of Christ. We're only able to help missionaries around the world and at home because of Christ. We're only able to, to help children in the Baptist children's home because of Christ. You take Christ out of the picture, December would be a very boring month. I know you'll think, well, we still got college football. <laughs> Dogs are still in it. Listen. The dogs don't even compare to my Jesus Amen. and the celebration of his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. John, the author of the fourth gospel, wants to turn everything, and, and he, he really gets in in the very first, right off the bat, into deep theology, high theology. It's been suggested. He leads to beautiful and profound insights throughout the gospel. But it's not always cute and colorful. It's tough to gather your children and grandchildren around Christmas Eve and around the tree and have them act out. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and on so forth and so on. You mean we don't get to parade around with donkeys and sheep? Well, maybe if you're looking for a donkey, you can call your pastor, you know. <laughs> but I love theology, the study of God. But I, can, I, I think there can be some danger in wanting to turn everything into high theology. And I think that sometimes we, we can miss, we, we can overemphasize, or, or we can take it apart, trying to put it back together. We can analyze too much. So, therefore, we have now Luke's gospel. Of all the four gospels, with their different perspective and emphasis, Luke understands that the story of God's people is ultimately about people and not just the high and mighty super elitist people in that day and age are today. We're introduced to just in the first two chapters of Luke a very infertile couple, an unwed pregnant teen, the working poor outside the city gates. Several women, the elderly, and most of all, a helpless, voiceless baby. God's story, written and told, is not through the rich, the powerful, 
and the educated, but through the meek, lowly, and vulnerable. Of all people, the story finds its way to a group of shepherds. One of the lowest vocations a person can have in the day in the life of Jesus. To be a shepherd was to be considered and looked upon as way down on the totem pole, as social, low, low, low class, no significant. You even you work with them sheep and you begin to look like them sheep and most definitely you smell like them sheep. And they were not regarded as very socially acceptable individual because of their vocation. Maybe how they looked, how they dressed, wasn't very financially secured. And so they were insignificant and not really valuable at all to the upper crust. But nevertheless, God, through the meek and lowly, brought about this wonderful story. And more than any other gospel, of far more than Matthew's, David, Messiah, or John's great I Am, Luke gives us a portrait of divine vulnerability. For he presents for us a God wrapped in swaddling clothes, a God who will bleed from every pore of his being and of his body. He came down to earth from heaven, who is God and Lord of all, and his shelter was a stable and his cradle was a stall. With the poor and mean and lowly lived on earth our Savior who was holy. With all the multitude of Christmas carols, and poems, novels, plays, video, nothing ever written celebrating the birth of the Savior can compare to Luke's compelling story. That in that day, oh man, oh my goodness, the most wonderful story ever told and ever lived. Are you capturing a little bit of the excitement and the buzz that Pastor Darrell is experiencing. Because y'all know, I've told you, I've warned you, that Chris, I get obnoxious. <laughs> yeah, well, you're that way without the Christmas story. <laughs> well, I know it. But let it be more than just a mere story. A mere bedtime something that we can use on Christmas Eve to get those little eyes to shut so that the other one, you know, can come. But even Santa doesn't compare to the Savior. I hope you know that. Even though there are many adults who say, I still believe in Santa. Okay, we need to talk. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that, okay? As long as it doesn't elevate him to the position and to the place that only Christ deserves. The story of St. Nick and St. does not even wear come close to this magnificent, marvelous, miraculous story. A miracle happened then. And just as it happened then, it can happen today for you and for me and for countless others. It has happened. I won't ever forget Never will I ever forget my first Christmas after being saved. Oh, my goodness. I think I, 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 I wept through most of the night because the revelation and, and that story encapsulated there was made real back six months before the celebration of when I accepted Christ as my personal Savior. This morning, there may be a decision that you need to make. You need to set aside all the other stories and this morning come to faith and trust in the real story. It's not fiction, but it's absolute truth. The greatest story ever told and ever lived. More than just a story. 
Maybe you're lost. You've never trusted Christ. But this morning, your heart is feeling something, and in your spirit there's something that you can't explain. Well, I can. It's the Holy Spirit drawing you in to the truth of this magnificent, wonderful story known as the story of Christ and the birth of Christ that we're getting relevance of. You can acknowledge I'm a sinner, I've lost, and I do not know Christ. And I want to come this morning, and I want to be saved. Maybe you've been saved, and you want to come, and you want to join in, in this fellowship. Maybe part of the Lord and believers of baptism, as we do. Maybe you want to come and move your letter from another Baptist church to here. Whatever it is, maybe these altars. I'm convicted. I, I, I have let the, 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 the wonderful, beautiful star of Bethlehem burn out. Listen. That star, for me, is not somewhere up in the cosmos. But that star lives, and his name is Jesus, right here in my heart and my life. But would you come, as Miss Alina comes, to lead us in a song of invitation? Whatever your desire, these altars are open. Whatever your desire might be. Give them a little traveling time to get in place. Let's stand and sing. Seated for just a moment, Wimberly and Josh. I want to present to you this morning, Josh Wimberly.